Hey everybody, this is Sean Harwell, and more importantly, this is the Never Heard of It podcast. Uh, this is episode 56.5, got another little tee-up episode for you in our 1985 series, but first, let me tee up my co-host. He's a man. He is a man of the nightmares that you're about to have, and I mean that in a good way. Tell us who you are, man. Craig... T up Nelson. Ooh. Yeah. That's me. I like that. Uh how are you doing, Sean? I I'm doing good. I just got so excited about the prospect of these two movies uh that we're gonna talk about today just by reading about the one that I'm gonna dive into a little bit here in a second. But you know, not only are we teeing this up for our Halloween episode. So we can get into some real deal horror. Mm. But, uh, man, there's some juicy stuff about these movies already that I know I'm just going to be like, uh, oh, boy, this is going to be fun. It's going to be fun. You know, I don't I don't uh, love the horror movies right. as much as you do. I frighten very easily. Uh, <laughs> but I'm excited. I, I genuinely am. I'm, I, I'm genuinely I, excited to see these two things. Both of these movies really kind of have pretty interesting backstories. Gosh, I feel like yeah. so. Yeah, it's gonna be good. Um, so uh, anyone who's listening, if you enjoy this tea up or any of our other episodes, we do do full episodes where we talk for long times about movies. But if you like that, you know, you can always find us online. We're on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, Instagram. We have our yeah. own site even called NeverHeardPodcast.com. You can find stuff there if you want uh, more. You know what I like to do, Craig. What what do you like to do? I like to just go to our site and look at the posters. Isn't that fun? sometimes we have kind of a nice collection of posters at this point? Yeah, we the really different do. movies that we've done. Yeah, yeah. So you don't honestly, you don't have to read anything. You can just go and scroll through, and it's like a cool like poster shop. It is, and I was going to bring that up when I was doing the weird science post for the last one because we talked about weird science and private resort. Uh, in mm -hmm. case uh, anyone didn't know, go back and check that out. But I found this p version of the poster that looks like maybe an early version of the of the movie poster. The weird uh, science that, poster? Yeah, that I'd never seen before. And like yeah. Anthony Michael Hall looks like he's like 10 years old on it. It's really yeah. bizarre. It's great. It's really painted and beautiful. Like I think it's fantastic. But for some reason, like Anthony Michael Hall just looks like, why, like, why did they put a 10-year-old uh, Anthony Michael <laughs> Hall on there? He looks a yeah. lot older than that in the movie. Uh, but go check it uh, out. It's It's a lot of fun. That'd be hilarious if they, uh, we, we need a photo, Anthony, and then that's what he gave them. <laughs> it's just like a 10 year old. Yeah. Anyway, um, let's talk then about Nightmare on Elm Street 2 and Friday the 13th, part 5. You are all my children now. Two biggest horror movies of the year, 1985. And I'm going to go first. We're going to talk about Nightmare on Elm Street 2 because A, it's Freddy's Revenge. Mm. So that sounds terrifying. Yeah. And B, yeah, most successful horror movie of the year, which I'll get to in one second. Now, Craig, mm. I just automatically assume that you've seen this at least three or four times? I've seen it a lot, yes. Okay, good to know. Good to know because uh, I'm going to be leaning on you, I'm sure, after we talk next week. Because I'm not going to go rewatch the original, and I don't think I've seen number two. I think I know I've seen part of number three, but I may be lost through the whole thing. I don't think oh, so, wow. but we'll see. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Nightmare on Elm Street 2 was directed by Jack Shoulder, who did Alone in the Dark, The Hidden, did some Tales from the Crypt TV, written by J David Chaskin, excuse me, who did The Curse. Uh, characters, of course, by the one and the only, Wes Craven, and stars the very familiar at this point, Robert England as Freddy himself. Uh, I think he also makes a cameo in his non-Freddy face. Mm. Uh, I guess that's his normal face, if you want yeah. to call it that. Uh, so we can look out for that. Uh, you got Mark Patton in the male lead, who uh, looks like I just noticed filmed uh, a role in the newest Amityville sequel, Evil Never oh. Dies, which is either out or is coming out this year. But uh, yeah, he's had a long break from acting. Uh, so, yeah, he's, maybe he's doing a little He's probably here. very rested, yeah. I think he is. I think he's got a lot of good sleep now. The dreams and nightmares are behind him. 
Uh, Kim Myers is also in this movie, and fun fact, allegedly was cast due to her resemblance uh, to Meryl Streep. Which she does kind of look wow. like a young Meryl Streep. She does. I can see that. She does. Yeah. Uh, Robert Russell, of course, from Weird Science we just talked about. Uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s cohort in crime in that movie is also in this movie. And Clue Gulliger, who, A, I love that name, B, Great. been in a million things. Like, I, I think he just, like, started in the 50s and never stopped. Mm-hmm. Uh, a ton of Western stuff. Also, Return of the Living Dead in 1985. A million other things. Uh, and Hope Lang, who... Played Mrs. Williams in Blue Velvet, which I don't remember Mrs. Williams, but now I'm like, damn, I gotta go back and watch Blue Velvet again. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she's been around for quite a t- while and was also in the original Death Wish. This movie was notoriously produced by Robert Shea, um, who was the former CEO of New Line and kind of got that entire company off the ground, and is one of the producers of all the Lord of the Rings movies, also a ton of John Waters movies. Uh, you got music by Christopher Young, who did Hellraiser, uh, and then things like Wonder Boys and The Shipping News and Spider-Man 3, so a very interesting, varied career there for that composer, yeah. Yeah. Cinematography, uh, two cinematographers on this movie, Jacques Haitken and Christopher Tufte. Both of these guys, I think, have some pretty amazing credits in just the camera department, but as stuff they've shot themselves... Uh, they definitely worked separately, and Haitken did Bloodsport 2 and Maniac Cop 3. Also did Shocker, another big Wes Craven movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got makeup by Kevin Yager, or Jaeger? Jaeger, Jaeger. Jaeger, okay, yes. Who This was, I think, his first real feature, and uh, later went on to do Glory and Face Off, and then special effects by Lit- Rick Lazzarini. Uh, Aliens, Spaceball, a ton of amazing credits. Mm-hmm. Uh, Craig, this movie came out uh, on November 1st of 1985, which I think we talked about before, which I guess, you know, that's right at Halloween weekend, so prime time there. Indeed. Almost, I was amazed to discover that this was literally almost a year to the day after the original was released. No clue. Um, so they rushed the hell out of this thing. Yeah. Um, it, I, I read that they started filming on like June 26th and were done sometime in August and then in theaters in November. So very quick wow. turnaround, very quick turnaround. Yeah. Uh, and as I mentioned, it did well. Uh, critically, it actually got some interesting reviews, one of which I thought was great from Janet Maslin, who was writing for The Times uh, in 85. And she said that the film has, quote, clever special effects, a good leading performance, and a villain so chatty he practically makes this a human interest story. <laughs> Which, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I will say, when I think of Freddy, I do think of the fact that he, he likes to talk, doesn't he? Yeah. Uh, we got a $3 million budget. It made uh, almost that its opening weekend, and it only finished in fourth place there, so uh, not too bad. Um, oh. Yeah, had Death Wish 3 was number one that weekend, interestingly. And then uh, in fifth place, Going Strong was Back to the Future and Commando right behind it. So... Nice. By the end of its run in 85, it had made almost $30 million. And, uh, well, I guess maybe that's its entire run domestically. And it finished 30th uh, on the whole thing for the year. And that's pretty darn good, you know? Yeah. For a movie that's as small as this and very specific horror thing. And, yes, it was the highest grossing horror film of the year. Uh, there was a lot of pressure with this movie because New Line was not in good shape at the time. I think, you know, they had had the success of the original, but they still didn't have a ton of cash flow. And mm-hmm. so uh, they did rush through production. And it says that, you know, at various times, Robert Shea was calling the shots, which led to things being somewhat uneasy between him and the director, Jack Shoulder, as you might imagine. Mm-hmm. And Robert England is quoted, I think, in the documentary about the entire franchise saying that, you know, there were definitely moments in this movie where Freddy appears to teenagers outside of dreams, which completely right. uh, goes against the uh, the rules set in the first one. So, mm-hmm. yeah, we'll have to look for, for some of that. Maybe you remember it fondly uh, for doing that. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, and then also, you know, Robert England apparently wanted a raise to do this sequel from what he had been paid the first go round, and New Line refused at the offset. And in fact, I think they filmed 
someone else in the role of Freddy just says uh, at an extra, I didn't find a name attached to it. And then quickly realized that that was a terrible idea <laughs> and caved to his demands. But um, apparently apart from Robert England himself, this is the only film in the entire franchise to neither feature an actor from a previous film nor have one return in a sequel. So maybe that's good for me in the sense that this is maybe the most standalone yeah. of the kind of original set. It's good. Yeah. It's also the only movie in the series uh, in which the lead character is male, which I thought was kind of interesting. I didn't think about that. That's true. Yeah. Uh, it looks like Brad Pitt, John Stamos, and Christian Slater all auditioned for the lead role of Jesse. Wow. Uh, and of course, of course, Craig, Michael J. Fox was considered but was too busy. Um, that would have been amazing. Yeah, it would have been really interesting. Been really bizarre, yeah. And uh, without having seen the movie or knowing about it, it sounds interesting to me because of the biggest detail about this movie and the most chatter about it that I found online is this. And I'll just read the headline from Decider.com that claims, A Night Run Elm Street 2 is the gayest horror movie ever made, end quote. Now, um, so, yeah, I didn't know any of this, but apparently, yes, it is notorious for having uh, undertones and themes that many perceive as homoerotic. And uh, it, it claims that originally filmmakers, specifically Chaskin, the writer, denied that there was any subtext that was intentional. Mm -hmm. Um but then later admitted that, yeah, it was intentionally written to the script in order to give the characters more depth. However, you can go on Wikipedia, and maybe we'll share these links, or you can just go down this road. Uh, Mark Patton, the actor who is openly gay, but I think at the time was not open, um, did not necessarily agree <laughs> with what Chasekin was doing there and has some very strong words about them. And I think they have a relationship that has been uh, very much, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, harmed by, yeah. I think, him being pushed into doing scenes which he knew were, were gay because they knew that he was gay. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, there was some disagreement there on how that was perceived. Uh, but I, I think apparently Mark Patton does at least sort of like amusingly claim the fact that he was the first male scream queen uh, and kind of like a male final girl, uh, if you will. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's all very, very interesting to me. And that got me super excited to see how the hell this is going to play out. And apparently, at least according to IMDb, some of those overtones really helped the European box office mm -hmm. because it's they totally were into that and got it. And uh, the popularity overseas is actually what convinced Robert Shea that they should make more of these. Uh, that and the fact that it made good money here domestically, obviously, of but course. that they could build a franchise around this. So, yeah, that's it. That's Not on Elm Street 2, the gayest horror movie ever made. Not my quote. Again, I uh, can't wait to see it. Agreed. I'm even more excited to watch it again now. This is one of those I haven't watched in a long time. Yeah. Uh, now, were you aware of? We'll, we'll get into all this next time. But yeah. the homoerotic stuff—is that something that you've been aware of in the past? For sure. Um, well, that'll be a nice change from some of the uh, very awful discussions of that subject in Once Bitten. So. Yeah. Well, and and that is kind of the thing. Yeah, I feel like yeah. Um, at least if memory serves, exactly. It's not that. Uh, it's not horrifying because people might be gay, right? Right. It's. it's it's just like this. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll be yeah, back. We'll see. We'll be back with that one. Well, dude, tell me about Jason Voorhees. What's he up to now? Chapter five. Chapter five. You know, and it's so funny. Uh, as a kid, um, obviously, I loved all these movies. Right. Although, as as it went along, I my love for them started to fall off. You know, like once once we got to chapter, probably chapter eight was the one <laughs> that finally broke me, and I and I was able to say, you know, these aren't necessarily good movies. Even just getting to part five seems ridiculous. And even more <laughs> ridiculous is the fact that the the movie before this one was called Friday the 13th Part 4, The Final Chapter. Final Chapter, yes. But back then, I guess, I don't know, it was especially ridiculous. And then you had A New Beginning. 
which is what we're going to talk about right now. Friday the 13th, Part 5, A New Beginning. I remember seeing in the paper the ad for this, you know, when it opened. And it just had this big poster, nothing, you know, that no one's really represented on it because there's, there are no stars in the movie. Sure. And all it says in big letters is, if Jason still haunts you, you're not alone. And I remember seeing that. And in 1985, I hadn't seen any of these movies. I had only seen oh, commercials wow. on TV, and I'd seen stuff in like Fangoria, and I was like, "Yeah, he totally haunts me," you know. <laughs> and <laughs> he does still and, haunt me, yeah. And, yeah, right. and and probably anyone certainly older than me, but anyone who had seen the four movies previous, I don't know how much they were really haunted. You know what I mean? Like at that yeah. point, they knew the 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 weak points, and the it was kind of goofy. But to me, like. Jason, I, I just couldn't even figure out what he was. Like he was just this weird guy walks around with a hockey mask yeah. and clearly is murdering people. It's scary. Anyway, uh, let's talk about the movie. Enough about me. Yeah. Uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part Five um, opened on uh, March twenty second, nineteen eighty five. I had a budget of about two point two million. Uh, so not not terribly much. I think now that's probably like worth six million or so. Yeah. Uh, director Danny Steinman. Uh, I read up on him. I was excited to see what other movies he did. Turns out, the biggest part of his bio is that he was a soccer star in school. Really? Uh, yeah. He he shot one uh, hardcore porn uh, called High Rise, and he did a horror movie called The Unseen, which led to another movie called Savage Streets that starred The Exorcist Linda Blair. And then part five of the Friday 13th series was his swan song. Wow. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, that, we should acknowledge that that's High Rise. That's a pretty good title for a porn. So I it mean, is. It's hard to like compete with that, I guess, if that's where you're starting from, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. How do you... Anyway, it's it's kind of like starting with Citizen Kane. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so this exactly was his last like movie, and it's Jeez. it's sort of one of those things where... So this movie was not well-received by the fandom of Friday the 13th, Sean, and I'm going to try and explain why. Okay. First, you have to imagine that people watched four Friday the 13th movies and still loved those movies, much like uh -huh. me. And by the time you get to the end of four movies... There's pretty much no one originally. There's like almost no one alive, right? Yeah, I mean, he's killed a lot of people with that. Point, he's killed right? a lot of people. He's yeah. the only, you know, he's the only thread that that weaves through all these movies. Mm -hmm. Um, that is until and it's we the meet final chapter. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, the, exactly. So in the in a final chapter, we met Tommy Jarvis, the character Tommy Jarvis, played by the Goonies' Corey Feldman. Gotcha. And spoiler alert, Sean, in case you're going to go back through these. At the end of part four, Tommy Jarvis kills Jason. He's dead. Tommy Jarvis is alive. Fantastic. So this movie is really kind of a departure from the ones that had come before. Mm -hmm. And because of how it departed from the rest of the series, fans didn't like it. And... I feel like, especially looking back on it now, the way in which it departs from the rest of the series is so minuscule that I just feel like it doesn't even really matter. Oh, geez. I feel yeah. like you like you like you, like looking back at it, like you'll understand a little bit, but at the same time, you're like, I, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to press that too much. Well, it's not like uh, a departure in that he goes to space, for example, or no, to exactly. Manhattan. No, right. he does. He doesn't so go to the big city. There were bigger departures to come. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And so it only made twenty-one million dollars. But then when you look at it, you're like, but it cost two million dollars, and it made twenty-one million dollars. Who's right. complaining? Yeah. And that's you know that's why they continued making them. But but this was kind of the point where this was kind of the breaking point because like after this movie, like each movie made less but uh aside from there is a, a Corey feldman cameo in this movie which he had to come and shoot on his day off from goonies so he was he was quite young then in part four yeah oh yeah how great would it have been if they got Corey haim to be in this one part five oh man 
That would have been killer. Killer. That's a good good choice of words. <laughs> radical. Also radical. Gnarly. Mm-hmm. Shavar Ross, who played Dudley on mm-hmm. Different Strokes, also has a prime role in this movie. Yeah. Which is another thing I remember as a kid seeing the commercials, seeing Dudley in a movie with Jason <laughs> was blowing my mind. Yeah. Completely destroying me. Uh because I didn't understand how anything in the world worked. I was like, but you have something that I as a kid like, and it's in that scary movie. Anyway, lots mm-hmm. of bridges being built there for me between hey, hey, hey. Jeff my bridges? world and Jeff Bridges, Bo Bridges, Bridges of Madison County. That's not who's the bridge at Todd Bridges. That's what I meant to say. I was trying to make the, Oh, Todd uh, Bridges. Yeah, that would have been better. Connect the two. Let's, let's uh, cut the rest of it up. out. Let's just yeah, cut no, it no, out. No. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. One of the things that I think people didn't like is it's not set at Camp Crystal Lake. So, what? Yeah, I, I calm down, Sean. I'm done. I'm out. It's, it's going to be all right. And another thing is, I I believe this movie has more has a higher body count and more skin than any of the other Friday the Thirteenths. Heyo. There's some like amazing gratuitous nudity. <laughs> but so so that's something to look out for. Lots of kills uh, for you, Sean. And okay. uh, Harry Manfredini is back doing the score as he did the score for all of them up to uh, the movie Jason 10. And and the score is wow. a huge part of the personality of these movies. Like I feel like exactly just that that whole thing. Um, it's it's man, it's effective. Even when the the movies got goofy. Like you'd hear yeah. that, it's like, yeah, we're in for some scary times. Sweet. Um, but yeah, so it, it finished forty uh, first that year. Not not too much of a slouch out of one hundred and eighty movies. No way. Um, yeah, it st- definitely feels like they they made for their money part back. Five of a franchise. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. good. You know, that's better than missing missing an action two did, if I'm not mistaken. It is. It is. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, some stuff to look forward to here. Hopefully this will uh, whet your appetite for part six, which I also think that even movies were, were pretty good in general. Part six was pretty pretty good. Anyway. You know what? Mm. Craig. Tell me. We're recording this on October 12th, and it's a Thursday. <gasps> Tomorrow's it's tomorrow. the day. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> All right. I got to go get my hockey mask. Um, mm-hmm. just, I like hockey. That's all. Uh, there's no, right. yeah. and I do have some stuff to clear in my backyard. So I am going to also get my machete. A lot of that um, sounds like a mistake. You're doing well, this clearing at night. I, well, yeah. I mean, okay. otherwise, um, yeah, it's just too bright. It's just too bright outside and hot. It's mm. been hot here. So yeah. So I'm going to no, do totally. that and I hope everyone will come back next week mm. as we really dive into these things. And get all freaky. Yeah. It's time to get scared. 